uh, good afternoon to one and all my humble pranams to his divine soul param pooja shri 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 dr balgan mahaswami ji param pooja shri 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 dr nirmalananda mahaswami ji reverend shri shri dr prakash nath swami ji i dr prasad csv hod serenity department jbt welcome you all to this webinar on an overview of geotechnical investigations a case study organized by civil engineering department jbt SJBIT was established in the year 2001 and civil engineering department in SJBIT was started in the year 2009 civil engineering department has an intake of 120 students and also running a pg programs in structural engineering and cad structure the department has a vtu research center and also a consultancy surrendering to the needs of the industry the department has also mous with industries which is helping faculty and students for academic enrichment and industry industry the department is organizing technical talks mdps national and international conferences from time to time of input cylinder your technical investigations are highly important in infrastructure projects and the idea of organizing this webinar is to try to see that all stakeholders of construction industry get to know more about it we have with us dr cr parthasarthi managing director sarathi geotech and engineering services private limited a person with vast experience to talk about the topic i now request dr ps ramesh professor civil engineering department to deliver the welcome address and introduce the speaker to the audience thank you sir thank you good afternoon to everyone my name is dr ramesh my name is, uh, i'm i'm here by I'm introducing Dr. Parsati. Many of us will know Dr. Parsati very well. He is the chairman and MD of Sarathi Geotech, which is located in Gandhi Bazar. He has done his Bachelor of Engineering and Master degrees from the Bangalore University, and he has and he has obtained his doctorate from IAS and Dr. Subha. He is uh, working for the land in offshore structures from 1993, and he went to Singapore for his next work after his PhD for seven years. And in 2007, he started his own company called as Sarthi Chitta. He is the chairman and MD of that, and this company is doing a lot of investigations both on offline, online, and offshore structures. Online. This is a brief uh, about the Parthasarthi. Many of us we know about Parthasarthi very well. I'll just uh, take this opportunity to introduce him. I'll also uh, request Parthasarthi to continue his speak to continue this uh, today's uh, today's uh, webinar on the overview of geotechnical investigation. Parthasarthi is. Thank you, Professor Ramesh. Uh, there are many participants uh, putting the message on the chat. The audio is not clear. Can someone confirm that audio is clear? Ramesh, uh, audio is clear. It's clear. It's clear. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Then I will continue the presentation, sir. So at the outset, uh, I thank the SJB Institute of Technology. for giving me an opportunity to share some experience and particularly dr ramesh we facilitated this uh, webinar and uh, uh, thank you for all the participants uh, who have joined this in spite of your busy schedule before i go to the presentations i pray god to give strength and immunity to all of us and amidst this covid uh, pandemic all of you please stay safe and stay healthy my topic of today's presentation is 
an overview of geotactical investigation, good practice. So I, I have divided this into the first half. I will be running through some practices in the offshore geotechnical investigation, and the later in the second half on the on-land geotechnical investigations. More precisely, on the first part, I will focus on uh, giving more information on the cone penetration testing (CPTs), which is uh, not very widely used in our on-land uh, geotechnical survey. And in the second part, on I will uh, discuss on the penetration test, which is a very widely used test, and what are the methods and how to get a normalized or a standardized values, and what are the implications of those standardized values. The last part will be uh, on how to get some good core samples to quantify a layer between the ore burden and the sheet rocks and how it affects your uh, computations on capacities and excavation methods etc etc so without wasting much of the time so i'll quickly go through the presentation now offshore site survey so always we advocate <coughs> integrated on site survey that is to perform a geophysical investigations identify the geohazards and develop the scope of geotactical investigations, use all the data together and use that for the foundation designs. Okay, like uh, we do in the offshore as well as in the land itself. Now, the knowledge of seabed soils and rock is essentially the offshore structure has to build safely and economically. And this offshore site investigation is called a special term raising the question and give a three-dimensional picture of the ground, both in the vertical directions as well as laterally. So as you can see here, the stratigraphies are by the geophysical methods. You can clearly identify the stratigraphy below the ground and it extends laterally. How uniform it is, is we can find out. So some of the geophysics, particularly the size is it if it is inclined it will be detrimental for the safety of the foundations that can be made out from the geophysical investigations you may have one boreholes here you may have one boreholes here and you may have one boreholes at this edge so this geophysical survey did connect to the boreholes physical method will not give you any quantifications of the parameters the engineering parameters but qualitatively it evaluates more uh, accurately the stratifications below the ground and if we want to have the quantifications of the stratigraphy we may have to go for the borehole testing right? now the offshore site survey can be characterized as a near shore survey if the water depth is around 50 meters shallow water about 150 meters Deep water between 150 to 1000 and ultra deep waters between 1500 to 3000 meters. So, this near shore water depth, about 15 meters, <coughs> it also follows mostly the onshore practice. So, when you go a little deeper into the uh, ocean, then the practice becomes difficult and you may have to adopt some different technology, different methods, different equipments. You need a boat, drill ships, etc. Right. this presentation. <coughs> So, so this is one of the structures is a mobile offshore drilling unit we also call it as jackup rigs this is a ship by itself will be torsion which has uh, three legs <coughs> and at the locations all the three legs will be lower down into the seabed and the entire uh, ship uh, is raised out of water from the flotation conditions all the loads from the ship will be transferred to these three legs the leg starts penetrating into the seabed and these legs will stop penetrating when the ultimate bearing capacity exceeds the <coughs> applied load. So then the rig is stable and there will be an air gap that is coming out of uh, the water to attain operational height. The cantilever will come out and then the oil and gas uh, explorations will happen here. So the drilling will start here. So once the exploration stage is completed, then you have to go for the production stage, at which stage there will be an installation of a fixed platform, as you can see here. These fixed platforms are constructed by fabricating a jacket structures. The length of these jacket structures to your location, they will append these uh, jacket structures and there will be piling 
uh, that will be driven through these jacket cans and uh, it goes below the seabed and you can see here the jacket so the piling can go below the seabed up to about 100 once the the piling is completed they will weld the stop deck you will see in the next slides and then there will be a drilling for with the through the conductors to reach your reservoir thus the production will commence and this uh, oil and gas that is produced here will be transported to the pipeline so this is a jacket structure when it is appended on the seabed it has to withstand the self weight of the structures we by means of this temporary sea floor support this is nothing but your bearing capacity of shallow foundations okay. there are various shapes and materials it can be wood it can be steel it can be circular rectangular it, ha it has to be designed with welded uh, before the welding of uh, the stop deck the pile will be driven through hammers okay now the entire platform is constructed ready for productions again the jacket pig will come for the second time to drill those wells now it is existing platforms one may have this entire drilling rig on top of the jacket that uh, <coughs> involves a huge uh, sizes of those structures becomes very uneconomical and this is a very widely practiced to bring the jacket rig for the second time to drill for the gas so here you have the foundation assessment for the jacket rigs the mud mat shallow bearing capacity assessment and the pile foundations for this fixed jacket itself when this jacket rig comes to next to the jacket there will be an interactions of these spud cans with the piling so there is a soil structure interaction studies so and many more geotechnical problems now as the explorations go deeper and deeper waters the piling also becomes deeper and and deeper into the seabed as you can see here is 100 meters 186 meters and beyond this 150 meters all this the structure are called compliant towers towers these are taller than any of those monumental structures that we are aware of okay and this is not very common what is common for the picture that will be shallow waters and plains. Uh, if the oil and gas explorations goes into the deep deeper water if it goes into deeper waters beyond the capabilities of the compliant structures then you will use the floating systems either for the production stage or for the exploration stage regard the floating structure should be anchored and that it will be held in positions to ensure the safety of those structures until the lifetime of the structures requirements so that also requires a thorough understanding of the ground to design those anchor systems for these floating structures uh, usually these floating structures are carried out in deeper waters <clears throat> okay. now there's always an integrated approach via multidisciplinary geo teams <clears throat> so for any ground assessment you will have the geophysicist you will have the geologist you will have the geotechnical engineers and the designers all work together so that the collective information is put in one place to make a decisions on the foundations for any of those structures that is particularly built on very harsh environment uh, in the ocean right. <coughs> the aim will be to determine the bathymetry that is the nature of seabed and the subbottom geology of the proper site identify the hazards Seabed, that is the seabed constructions, existing pipelines, submarine cables, poke marks, buried channels, rock outcrop, etc. And it also should aid in elevation of engineering characteristics of shallow soils and soil seismography for evaluation of the soil or the foundation depths, also to understand the lateral continuity of the strata. Now the equipment used for these geophysical methods will be uh, echo sounders, uh, that is the bathymetry, side scan sonars to scan the image in the ground, and the sub-bottom profiler for getting the stratigraphy below the ground. So this is how you see the echo sounder, the single beam echo sounder. If it is a swath or a multi-beam echo sounder, you will have a wider coverage in the single uh, line of data acquisition. And normally the bathymetry will be done in the, the grid fashions, both longitudinally as well as laterally. Okay. <clears throat> now you see a tow fish. This is a side scan sonar. This will also be embedded along with the bathymetry. 
and this uh, side scan sonars will give you the image of the seabeds. For example, so you have fish and that is debris for any future constructions. You may have a sand ripples. This also will be an hazard for the emplacement of the jackup fish, particularly the crust and the trust are very uh, deep. <clears throat> Therefore, the sky scan sonar will be able to identify those hazards. So once you have finished the side scan sonar, the other one will be for sub bottom profiler, which will give you the stratifications below the ground. Either one can use a finger data, which is very good in the top 10 meters for your shallow foundations, pipelines, etc. You can also use a boomer. It is good for 30, 40 meters in normally consolidated homogeneous profiles. And the sparker is a high energy uh, sub bottom profilers. Even in heterogeneous profiles, it can have a penetration of up to about 60 meters below the seabed, where you can identify these layers A, B, C, and so on. You see the sub bottom profile, this is the seabed. Interpretation of that can also give you that there is a channel features. There's going to be one layer here, one layer here. More significantly in this kind of interpretations, the blue line on the top is a seabed. And the remediate uh, red line will give you the thickness of the soft layer layers. And you could see here this green line, this blue line, this uh, brown line. So these are all the stratifications that are identified by the sub, sub bottom profiler very clearly identifying the stratigraphy. You could also see here, this is a channel features. There could be some river flowing over several thousands of years before, and potentially this material inside these channel features can be variable, okay? And nobody wants to put their structures in these channel features because of the reasons of the heterogeneity in the materials. Uh, if you, you cannot identify the channel features without your physical Investigation. The survey will be able to identify one of the potential hazard for uh, installation of the foundations. Now, these geophysical methods are put in the water and towed and get the data. So, what if the water depth exceeds more than 1000 meters, right? Deep water, you will not get that kind of uh, resolutions. Therefore, all this equipment will be inside the autonomous underwater vehicles, AUV. Okay, and this will be launched by the ship. It will be taken down, controlled by the people on the deck itself, on the ship, up to about three to four meters off the seabed. So once it reaches the seabed, just about three, four meters above seabed, then the survey will be carried out. And then the entire UV will brought to the deck, and then the data will be laundered, and you get very high resolutions. And this AUV is useful and normally used in deep waters. So once you have finished the geophysical investigation, next thing is to identify the geohazards. Now the geohazards can be described as a site and local condition having a potential of developing into a failure event causing loss of life or investments. Very clearly, as I said in the Jacobrig emplacement, there could be a crustal layer, very thin crust, which may be missed out in the geotechnical investigations and that could be a hazard. When you lift the entire ship out of water, all the three legs going down, so one of them um, may have a very thin layer of, of the crust come to the crust of the other leg locations. Then what happens when this crust breaks at one leg locations, there will be a rapid punch through happenings and you could see the collapse of these rigs. So this is a hazard. Okay, And there could be a channel features. Nobody wants to put their foundations in a weak uh, flank, which is also have a failure uh, plane. <clears throat> so if you don't uh, identify these hazards in plastic jacket rigs, you may see distress to the jacket. There may be a many number of geohazards based on the specific project, specific structures that may need to be identified. I'm just giving you an overview in this presentation. There could be some rock outcrops during the rig move. The rigs can touch the seabed if it's soft clay, but if it's rock, if it's touching the seabed, you see the damaged legs. And there's an hazard that can be identified by the edge scan sonar image that the crop so that you have to mitigate and alter your remove procedures. So there could be hazards when the seabed is uneven. So I hope all of you are... Hey! So 
there could be a situations where you have a deep water infrastructure already in place with the anchor system. There could be some submarine sites. What happens? Mudline, what movement is happening? Some knock off one of these anchors. The entire stability of the structure will be jeopardized. We need to identify whether there's going to be any kind of submarine slides or to the past slide whether this uh, ground at this level is uh, good enough to hold uh, that anchor system. So this is the geohazards. I'll come to the geotechnical. The, <coughs> so the, the geotechnical okay, and you have a uh, drilling rig uh, fixed at the center of the ship. Pull the openings, pull down your drill pipes. You will have a seabed tablet that rests on the seabed, which also provides some reaction. And then you continuously take some lines. So as you go deeper, Right. So drill ships can also be anchored four numbers or six numbers along the four corners and positions. And these anchors will work only up to water depth of about 80 to 100 meters. If you want to have a geotechnical investigations in beyond that 100 meters water depth, you need to have an anchor less hold these drill ships. Okay. Now the very <laughs> that is uh, up in this part in uh, here in, uh, in the Middle East. All of this is a uh, this, this was in Vietnam. This is also a Russian vessel in here. This was in Singapore. This is the such a actually it capsized a few years before in western coast of India. Okay, and this is was in Malaysia. All the three of them. This was in Middle East. So I had the opportunity to work on all these drill ships as a quality control engineer, representing oil companies, managing large geotechnical, particularly constructions. You can also have these deep water drill ships, which can drill the boreholes and collect samples in water depths as deep as around 100 to 2,000 meters waters. So I had an opportunity to work on this vessel called Bavit in Malaysia in the year 2000. Importantly, with ready to come investigation the first thing we have to do is to establish the mud line so that is a baseline from which you are recording the penetrations of uh, the holes so how it is done so when everything is ready and you lower down okay there will be a bottom sensor that will be lowered down into the drill pipe nicely it will come and rest on the landing ring okay. now once it rests on the landing ring the entire pipe is lowered down okay. When it lower down, there will be a switch that is in contact with the mud line. When the circuit closes here, you see the ohm meter. Instead of that, if you put a bulb, it will flow there. So that is a point at which you are sure of uh, that touching the seabed, and immediately you mark zero on the pipe on the deck at some reference point, and collect your mud line sample. Maybe if you push the sampler one meter, so it will be a sample between zero to one meter. Correct. And then advance the boreholes to one meter and collect the samples between one to two meters. And likewise, you advance to the target penetrations. Very important is also to use drilling fluid or drilling mud. So we use this Marshall funnel or the viscometers to prepare the mud. The Marshall funnel, the mud will be taken with a quantity, known quantity, and the orifice and find out the time that it takes to empty out in this funnel. So that should be between 60 to 90 seconds that is usable for the drilling purpose. Suppose if the uh, <coughs> Marshall funnel has a 120 second, that means it takes more time to empty out than it is very thick, so you add more water. Suppose it empties in 30 seconds, that means it is very fluid, then you add more uh, mud and make that consistency. Finally, you check with the viscometers, fill up this uh, up with the mud and then in the graduated scales you have the bubble to be here like a triple beam balance then directly it can reach what is the consistency normal drilling uh, per se you will have to have a consistency or a viscosity of about nine parts per gram if you don't ensure that then you will see some bad samples i'll show in the next uh, subsequent slides now this drilling and sampling is a concurrent activity 24 bar 7 offshore okay so the turnover on times if the contractor is very professional it will be hardly around 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, you will get the samples, which will be extruded, it will be photographed, it will be cut into pieces like this. There will be testing performed. 
Okay, I'll show you what are the tests to be performed. And finally, it will be packed for the further testing onshore and be ready for the next samples. Okay, and you see these samples are photographed. All of them are good samples. Some Russian uh, some contractors gives a very large undisturbed samples is about 110 millimeters diameters. If you use a Shelby tubes, I will talk about this, which has an area ratio of 10%, you will get the best uh, samples. Even in sand, you can get good undisturbed samples. More importantly, I would have loved to have these samples packed for further testing onshore, for example, the direct shear test or triaxial test. But if you have a very inexperienced engineer who is working on this, then he will nicely cut the samples, have pulverize the samples and take pictures. So <laughs> you need to be very careful. So if you have good undisturbed samples, better. Only a slice, you can cut it to feed the samples, but the rest of them, good samples, you pack it nicely for further testing. Onshore, it will give you an invaluable information on the engineering properties of those samples. If the mud is not prepared properly or circulated, you could see that the cuttings are not washed. Okay, so all these cobbles and pebbles. It's a gravel pieces. So these are all the wash samples. We, that's not the material that exists at that locations. All the fines are washed away. The coarse materials are not washed, and therefore you get this kind of uh, list of material. Even if the boreholes are not washed properly, okay. Now you could see even cohesive soil, the stiff clays exist at the ground, but you could see this all disturbed, very soft clays. For every meter of the samples that is collected, one has to perform a torvane, minivane, pocket pentrometer, and UU test. All these four tests will give you the undrained shear strength or SU, unit weights, moisture content, reaction to HCL, and sample preservations. I'll talk about this HCL in a minute. Now, the torvane tests are performed like this. You cut the samples level. You have three sizes of the plates for the soft clays, for the normal soils. If you have a very stiff clays, then you can use a smaller plate. Okay. Now, uh, with a uniform vertical pressure, you try to rotate this uh, torvane so we should shear the soil. So you cannot slip, it has to shear. Once the soil shears, then you can directly read on this graduated scale at the top the undrained shear strength. And this is a motor vein or a mini vein, so you have a vein blade which is inserted into the samples. You have a spring which is calibrated. There are different springs of different stiffness and also the blade sizes will be different. So once you insert this vein blade into the samples, you give a rotation so that the vein will shear the sample here. So you can note down the initial uh, readings and also the degree of rotation, the final readings. Then for a combination of the spring and the blade, there will be a calibration KPA per degree. So if you know the degree of rotations directly, you apply that calibration constant and you can get your undrained shear strength. And this is a pocket pentrometers. So you have a splindle at the bottoms, which one diameter we call it as the stylus that is pushed into the, the samples and you have a graduated uh, scale. Okay. Directly, this will read the unconfined composite strength of the soils and the QU divided by two, that is half the unconfined composite strength is your undrained shear strength. Okay, you have three different methods. You can perform on the same samples and you get three different values to plot together. And this is very important. You can also do an UU triaxial, the unconsolidated undrained triaxial, which is very, very popular. And we give more reliance to it because it is, simulates your stress conditions by applying a confining pressures. So you apply a confining pressures and develop a stress strain curve, then you get a deviator stress half the deviator stress will be your undrained shear strength. So you compare the undrained shear strength with all of these tests. If the soil is between firm to stiff consistency, that is 25 to 50 kilopascals, by and large, all of them will be in close, uh, <coughs> this one, correlations, maybe about five to 10% variance. But if it is exceeds stiff clays, then we always prefer to have this UU test performance, which will simulate the in-situ stress conditions. Moisture content for every meters, you can do a moisture content. You can have a unit weight. You know the dimensions of the soils. You can get the volumes. And the reaction to HCL, this is very important. So now, if uh, this is a qualitative assessment, initially you do it on offshore, on board. When the uh, sample reacts to HCL vigorously, that means it has high calcium carbonate content. When you see a high re vigorous reactions, then further you subject the samples to carbonate content test in the onshore laboratory. So what's the difference? Suppose if it's a sand, is a high calcium carbonate content, is called carbonate sand, and without any calcium carbonate, is called silica sand. 
in the terms of capacity, for example, the pile capacity, if you have some uh, unit skin friction limitations, say around 80 kilopascal for a silica sand, for a carbonate sand, it'll be only around 15 to 20 kilopascal. So it'll be one fourth or one fifth reduction in the capacity. That's the material properties itself. So it's one of the most problematic soils that you have to be very careful in characterizing that material and choose an appropriate ground model for designs. Now, there's also a soil structures, very importantly, very important, necessary. One is the silicon side is not a knife cut. This is actual fissure that exists in the ground. Okay, but the low stress levels, this will fail and then the surface will be a soapy structure. You could also see an expansive nature. The samples are expanding. This indicates there could be some accumulated shallow gas. So you have to be very careful. Probably there could be some blowouts. So when you see some expansive, that is the soil samples coming out of the sample tubes, it indicates shallow gas. And there'll be some appropriate measures to tackle the shallow gas and counter it during the investigations. Nicely, you pack these samples and further uh, you plan for any other test that is not carried out offshore. So offshore, you can get your unit weight moisture contents for every meter of soils under shear strength. So you get the strength profile. So if you have sand layers, you can do that. If you want some drain test, drain test, some other uh, stress uh, related stress, you can perform in the onshore laboratory by these samples that are nicely packed and stored vertically, okay? And then transported to the lab. So I'll just give you some brief about the cone penetration testing. So far, we talk about collecting samples and testing offshores. There's also a practice that you can conduct in situ cone penetration test. So historically, the cone penetration test was developed in 1930s as a mechanical cone. Even our IS code, even today, only specifies the mechanical cones. We don't have an option to, in the IS code, to use a, a piezo cone that can measure the pore pressures. Then the electric cones were developed in 1960s. And later on in 1970s, the offshore geotechnical investigation uh, CPTs were developed. And advancement after that resulted in the pore pressure measurements. Now it is conveniently, it is used. More reliable load cells, addition of seismic and shear wave velocities, and additional sensors for environmental applications, and significant increase in documented case studies. So you have enough of, uh, correlations that is exist between CPT and other engineering parameters. So with very high confidence, you can use the CPT data for interpreting the results of the ground. Now the CPT and its enhanced versions such as the CPTU and the seismic CPT is CPT. So normally we confuse, no, say CPT is a static cone penetration. Yes, it is static cone, but SPT, SCPT is corresponds to your seismic cones. Okay. In addition to the pore pressures, it can also measure your shear wave velocity, which has an extensive applications in a wide range of soils. Although the CPT is limited primarily to softer soils with modern large pushing equipment and more robust cones, the CPT can be performed in a stiff, very stiff soils and in some cases, even in soft rocks. Today, we have a capability of CPT that can go up to 100 MP of resistance. So we look at that, what is the cone resistance? And most widely used CPT is around 10 centimeter base square area, although there are smaller cones and also the larger cones for softer materials and the smaller cones is for very stiff or hard materials. Now, in your testing soft clays, since the area is very small here, there's also a practice that you can use a ball penetrometer or a T-ball penetrometer, which will have a good resolutions and better measure the parameters for very soft clays. And this is mostly used for pipeline uh, studies where you top half a meters in deep waters are very much essential. That will be characterized with this ball penetrometer and T-bar penetrometers. The advantage of CPTs, fast, Continuous profiling you can get, repeatable, reliable results and not operator dependent, economical and productive, strong theoretical basis for interpretations. But what are the disadvantages? It's relatively high capital, requires skilled operators, no samples during CPT and penetrations can be restricted in gravel or cemented layers. But these advantages supersedes the disadvantages and thus a wide applications is seen in the offshore industry, particularly the use of the cone penetration test. 
as far as the apparatus are concerned it will have a trust ma machine it have a reaction equipment push rods piezo cone penetrometer and a measuring system this is how you see there is a reaction frame okay you have a cone here and this is a cone rods and these cone rods will be pushed with the wheel drives it's operated hydraulically mechanically more electric motors whatever the facilities that have okay and there will be a data cable running from the cones inside the cone rods all the way to your data acquisition system now you look at this cross section of these cones you have a typical apex angle which is normally 60 degrees and the base area 10 cm square is very widely used although there are other sizes are also used uh, sleeve frictions commonly for 10 cm square will have a 150 cm square of uh, sleeve friction and mostly the pore pressure is measured just behind the tip although the other location like u1 and u3 has been in use but normally maybe in my experience almost 100% i have seen that measurement of u2 it is at the back of the cone tip itself we call it as the shoulder so the important measurements of this test will be your cone resistance qc we'll see how to get this sleeve friction and the pore pressures inclination this is very important because it cannot be pushed and inclination it has to be restricted and penetration depth and the rate normally around 200 mm per second is the rate and that is prescribed by some codes stm codes and you will be pushed at the constant rate and the data logging frequencies and this is the raw data what you can see from the cpt test so what you see on the left side the first graph will be your cone resistance out of the and the sleeve friction is the middle graph and the pore pressure <coughs> So how to get this cone resistance? It will be the total force made to push the cone divided by the area of the cone, and the sleeve friction is the force <laughs> measured on the sleeve of the cone divided by the area of the sleeve, and this is the U2 measured by the pore pressure. This red one is your hydrostatic pressures, and the this difference will be your excess pore pressures delta U. This CPT data can be seen in real time. on the screen as you push the cones the blue ones is your cone resistance the red one is your sleeve friction and the yellow one here is your pore pressures okay the cones has to be calibrated you can have a site calibration unit to ensure that these uh, equipments are functional you can also get a calibration certificate from the manufacturer or <coughs> the calibration agencies all to ensure that this inaccuracy should be around less than 1% as prescribed by the astm codes okay and uh, both for the tip resistance local frictions which has a maximum of 1 mpa the inaccuracy will be around 0.01 mpa and with the pore pressures also okay this again one of the important uh, aspects of this cone testing is to deair the cones in a chamber apply vacuum pressures fill this with glycerin in order to have a good pore pressure response and these following components should be entirely saturated that is your pore pressure filter the cavity of uh, the between the pore pressure filter and the pore pressure sensor and housing of the pore pressure sensor itself and why is this necessary and important and you could see on the right side this is more saturated cones which have a good uh, pore water pressure measurements but as the saturation depletes or decreases you could see the resolutions uh, comes worse and worse and it further deteriorates and you will not get any good data so without any pore pressure measurements you will not be able to do any further interpretation so oh, i would draw your attention also as i said this pore pressure is measured behind the, the cone tip at the shoulder you are draw your attention to the net area of the cone okay. this is a manufacturer <coughs> uh, guidelines the net area of the cone we define as a net area ratio of the cones that is the net area divided by the total area so why is this important different manufacturers have different area ratios of the cone so some of them has a high area ratio or 0.8 some manufacturer have very low area ratio of 0.38 so when you have this 0.8 as area ratio the interpretation no the correction factors 1 minus alpha values becomes very small on the contrary if you have a low area ratio 
1 minus alpha this huge magnitude will be a correction factor applied to your measurement so that uh, gives you a lot of inaccuracies and inconsistencies and we don't prefer to have a very low area ratio straight away reject it and normally what we see in the offshore with various contractors this value varies between 0.75 to 0.8 now if you have a uh, measurements by various cones having different area ratios this gives you different results when you normalize it then it all of them fall in one line. So how to get a corrected cone resistance, QT. So this corrected cone resistance will be your rod QC values as you push it with different area ratios plus U2 is a pore pressure into one minus alpha. Now the excess pore pressure is delta U, that is your U2 minus U0. And friction ratio is your sleeve friction divided by your cone resistance and lastly the pore pressure uh, ratio pq is your delta u that is your u2 from the pore pressure measurements minus u naught is your hydrostatic divided by qt is your corrected cone resistance minus your pore burden pressure there are various rigs that <coughs> is in uh, operations you could see all of them on the left side is the land rigs that can push the cones with the various cantilage uh, formation. This is an offshore <coughs> drilling rig. We use the same uh, uh, drilling rig <coughs> that is the, used for the sampling boreholes to push the cones. Instead of sampler, you push the cone. And this is an umbilical cable <coughs> from the cone all the way it goes to your data acquisition system. So let us examine this seabed of CPT testing. That is pushing the cone from the seafloor until refusal or to predetermine penetrations. This is exactly what we do on land itself. On the land CPTs, we try to push from the ground until a desired penetration is achieved or the cone gets refused. This is exactly done like this. You have these uh, uh, seabed templates, okay, and then there's a cone. And this will be pushed to the wheel drive we already seen in the earlier slides and the data cable is connecting from the cone goes all the way to the data acquisition system suppose if it's a deep water so you cannot run your data acquisition cables to maybe a kilometer to a thousand meters water depth in that case we use a memo cone here there will be a memory chip inside the cone house just all the data will be recorded there only when the cones are taken to the deck you can download the data so you cannot see the data in real time when you use a memo code so this is a water depth you have the seabed templates and you're pushing the cone okay. so once you have reached a sufficient penetration that is good enough for your designs or the refusal happens there are various termination criteria the inclinations of the seabed the inclination of the cone the cone uh, getting maxed out in terms of bone resistance, maxed out in terms of friction or any other operator, operational operator's discretions in the safety of the equipment, they're going to terminate the test. So this is how you see the raw data. So the blue one is your cone resistance, the red one is your sleeve friction, okay. and this is a friction ratio, sleeve friction by cone resistance, and this curve is your pore pressures. Clearly, you can identify the stratification here. So this is going to be one strata at the top. This is going to be another strata. We have a stiffer material. There will be a very weak layer. And there will be a further <coughs> strata at the bottom. So this is exactly correlated in the boreholes and that locations. You can see the layer break in the boreholes and a very thin layer has been identified, which is also captured in your cone resistance. So if you do only samplings, perhaps you may miss out these thin layers, but it can be captured as you're pushing the cone to three meters length. Sometimes three meters, even in deep waters, is only one meters because of the safety of those uh, equipments. Uh, normally, there'll be a one meter push. Now, <clears throat> when the data is not enough from the seabed, that is, you're pushing from the seabed to a certain penetrations, then you have to go for the downhole mode. So in the downhole modes, you push the cones to three meters, for example, then you wash these boreholes, then you push it another three meters, wash these boreholes, push this another three meters, wash these boreholes and continue until you reach your desired penetrations. 
at every push the bottom of the borehole is reached and the cone is zeroed at the bottom of the borehole so it's a different here so here you are doing uh, the zero at the bottom of the uh, boreholes and then you are continuing for three meters then you wash another three meters then again you zero it so when you do this downhole mode it has to be corrected for that hydrostatic head as though you are doing the test from the ground levels okay this is a hydraulic thrust being activated and you can see the data in real time so how to get those corrections for the cptu zeroed at the bottom of a boreholes so as i said earlier u2 is a pore pressures so this is a pore pressure measured at the bottom of the boreholes you correct this gamma w into d where the depth at which the cone is zeroed that will be a hydrostatic head you are acting adding to this measured there u2 and this entire quantity will be a u2 that is as though you are doing the test from the seabed so likewise you are qc will be qc star that is qc measured from the bottom of the boreholes then your hydrostatic head then you correct your compute your corrected cone resistance and your excess pore pressures so how to get this this is qc star plus your hydrostatic head is nothing but your qc and this will become your actually u2 and delta uh, delta u2 is this quantity which is u2 minus your u0 is your hydrostatic head so when you have a downhole mode you just try to correct that and then get your qc qt and your delta u parameters now one more important aspects to note here is the normalized cone resistance capital qt which defined as your small qt there's a corrected cone minus your total overburden pressure divided by your effective overburden pressures normalized the friction ratio okay and this is a free sleeve friction divided by your corrected cone minus your total overburden pressure and the pore pressure ratio we have already seen this these three parameters are very important for your uh, interpretations of the cpt data for correlating with the soil properties i'll explain to you in a minute so as rot has uh, defined these normalized factors robertson this is a canadian journal geotechnical journal has used that Uh, normalized uh, parameters and develop this interpretation chart even today this is global that is many people in the world use this robertson uh, uh, interpretation charts you see on the y axis is your normalized cone resistance on the x axis is your normalized friction both of them are capital or you can have a normalized cone on the y and the pore pressure parameters bq so for example this uh, can be divided into different zones you suppose those data points fall in this zone 3 that indicates that the material can be clay or is clay and so with this also if it falls anywhere in the zone 3 it can indicate clay it can go to the higher number then it becomes more cohesion less so we have also developed our internal spreadsheets and also the charts based on that uh, interpretation values and you see these data points falling here all the green color ones identified as cohesive material in the normalized cone resistance to bq plot also in the zone 3 you could see these are all the cohesive materials and zone 5 and 6 these are all cohesion less materials so you could see 5 is sand and 6 is sands as well so this one interpretation is clubbing together and you could see this is one homogeneous clay you can have one small uh, silt layers between around say 12 to 15 meters it's very useful cpt test to characterize the ground particularly in stratifications very very distinctly and also you see this capital uh, ut and the normalized friction and this is a soil behavior type number this is exactly the same what we saw in the previous slides so for example in zone 3 all of them are homogeneous but this becomes little bit more silty okay and this is all clay profile with some small intrusions of silt and sand layers i'll pick up a couple of case studies then i can move on to the next topic so in one western offshore <coughs> project lng this is a raw data the red one is your tip resistance the blue one is your sleeve friction okay this is a pore pressure and this is a sleeve friction ratio the green one is a friction ratio all you can identify from this these are the layers that you can be identified 1 2 3 4 5 it has a very good correlations with the boreholes these are the layers that is exactly matching with the cpt data 1 2 3 4 5 boreholes okay 
So this is for the stratification and also you can use this for your engineering properties of the soils, but I'm not going to talk about it because of the paucity of time. And the last case study on this first half will be the uh, CPTs. You see here, there's a continuous push of CPT until the design penetrations of 150 meters. And also there is a bump over boreholes of continuous sampling. There's a one is to one correlation between the CPT and the boreholes. And you could see here, the layer has been changed from the coercive material to more silty and sandy materials. Okay, and then this is predominantly cohesive, except this thin layer at the end. So if you interpret this very nicely, you can see a crustal layer. Most of them, most of the materials is cohesive. You can get to intruded sand layers. There should be some fun when people are working offshore or guys are really enjoying. That's the way to go. Now quickly, I'll get into the next sessions. That is the onshore site investigations. As we all know, standard penetration test is widely used in situ test. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about the other in situ test because of the paucity of time. <clears throat> now, wide wide, if you see, there's a 85% usage of standard penetration test. So I'll be talking a few minutes on this uh, test, and there'll be a thin wall Selby tubes about 6% and so on. So very important is to use a sampler that has an area ratio of less than 10% uh, for the samples to be undisturbed. But what we normally use here is a non-standard, it's not a seamless pipe, it's all jointed pipes, various uh, sizes and dimensions which have an area ratio, maybe 20, 30, 40, 20 to 30%, maybe sometimes more. So that really do not have uh, a very less area ratio and thus your samples qualities are jeopardized. Unlike what you see here is a seamless Shelby tubes. We normally use it in offshore to get the best quality data. Perhaps we need to change our practice also to get good quality samples with the Shelby tubes. You can also get your representative samples if it is sand. Make a trial pit, inspect a trial pit for visual inspections. You can get a chunk samples or drive a core cutter to get the samples and if you're happy with that uh, information perhaps you can get away with the investigations with the trial pit itself otherwise you have to do the boreholes by augers is a mechanized uh, augers but it's not very popular in our country what is popular in our country is a manual auger okay people three or four people rotate it then they clean the bore so augers and advance the boreholes as you reach that penetrations you conduct a standard penetration test okay so the standard penetration test is conducted with the sampler at the bottom. You have a 63.5 kg weight lifted and dropped by 75 centimeter height. Then you now record the number of blows for three successive uh, intervals of 15 centimeters. The first 15 centimeters is termed as seated, a sitting blow and the last 30 centimeter, the cumulative number of blows is termed as N values, okay? Now very important when you open the spit zone samples, if the sample get uh, into half, like this, this is indicative that it is more cohesion less. It's all silty sand. If you don't get the break in the half, probably as an indicative, it has more cohesive material and is a clay. And you have record these N values, okay, and then the stratifications and terminate the boreholes. This is no different from the Western practice using a stem auger. This is in the US. Also record these SPTN values and terminate the boreholes. Okay. Now, if you want to have investigations to much deeper depths, then you use a rotary drilling rig. This is a primitive calyx rig, or you can use an hydraulic rig. So I'll just explain the difference in a few slides after. So in this rotary rig, regardless of the equipment used, you circulate your mud from the center of the rod, and through the annulus between the boreholes and the drill rods, the cuttings will come to the top, and you are advancing the boreholes. In a way, you may be able to get your uh, disturbed or a wash samples if you are not using the appropriate mud. It's the same thing we talked about in the offshore investigations. You need to have a consistency of drilling mud. Offshore, we use uh, polymers or the guar gum. So in onshore, we use the bentonite, right? Bentonite is more expensive than cement. So many people do not want to use that and try to do the shortcuts. You don't get these good samples because you are not cleaning the boreholes properly. Uh, with the drill fluids. And then you conduct your standard penetration test. And so with your cohesive soils 
and you see it is a disintegrated rock very dense silty sand you open the sampler you get the samples into half okay now <clears throat> very important also is to measure the depth of the boreholes you need to know what depth you are conducting the spt sampler and also to advance your boreholes after the test is uh, conducted either to carry out the test or to collect your undisturbed samples you need to be at the appropriate and the right depth so you need to measure every time so let me talk a few minutes on the history of spt this is very very important since this is very widely used in 1902 charles go of go constructions used a 1 inch diameter sampler in mid 20 1920s spit spoon sampler was introduced okay in 27 go used 2 inch spit spoon sampler finally in 1947 tazagi christen that is the name the raymond sampler as the standard penetration test at 7th international conference on soil mechanics and foundation engineering in 1948 tazagi and peck published the first spt correlations and finally astm adopted that in 1958 as the 1586 you see worldwide many people have their own codes even in india we have this is2131 okay perhaps we have the revised version now in reaffirmed in 2002 that's nothing has been changed but most of the places they use this astm d1586 so why to conduct an spt and why is it necessary because get your static soil properties like your relative density friction angle and under inertia strength you can also make a static analysis that is estimating bearing capacity and settlements you can predict your pile capacity for deep foundations also evaluate your dynamic soil properties that is your dynamic shear modulus shear wave velocity and also the liquefaction potential right now you could see here in this curve n values and the cyclic stress ratio we could demarcate whether the zone will be liquefiable on this zone or it will be not liquefiable on this zone so that's the importance of having this n value so i draw your attention it is n160 so let us examine what is that in the next few slides the standard penetration testing there are several non standard variables one is the hammer itself so there are different types of hammer that is invoked it is a safety hammer automatic hammer and the donut hammers with 90% in our country we use these donut hammers the people involved it can be an experienced personnel non experienced concerned and there may be some negligent people the size of the drill rods several people use different size of the drill rods normally for spt aw size is uh, you preferred is also codified okay and the drill methods you can have augers which doesn't uh, use of drilling fluids maybe if you use a drilling fluids then you need to keep control on the uh, consistency of those drilling fluids it should tub sampler itself on the shape and the liners our is code doesn't permit to use of liners but some codes including astm permits to use the liner samplers right this is a pin drop to drive the spt this is a donut mostly in the country 95% we use this is a safety hammer and an automatic so once this is lifted to a certain height 75 cm it has a free fall automatically it will fall on the anvil there will be number of turns on the ropes usually what is prescribed is a manila rope but we use all kinds of ropes here right and number of turns will also see here the spts are performed by varieties and this slide i only see here is an instrumented uh, rod which is measuring the energy transfer so why is this important we we'll just examine so in 1981 the national building standards in the us has conducted this and released this document i draw your attention on this impact velocity okay if you have number of turns on this cathed rope okay one turn two three turns as the number of turns increases your hammer velocity decreases implying your energy transferred to the rod is going to be very very less than your potential energy right and so the energy ratio will also be very less it is the same from the previous slides and what they have identified that it could be variance between 40% to 85% if this is the variations the where is the standardizations of the n values 
So if there some systems measure 40% energy transfer, it have very high blow counts, which has 85% energy transfer has a very less blow counts. So you are not comparing apples to apples, but it has to be standardized. And world over, I see the literature suggests that is compiled by Batilas, which also suggests that the energy can be as low as around 30%, can be as high as around 90%. Okay. Now this. SPT equipments are not standardized and as you could see here the donut hammers can be a low uh, energy transfer of 30 percent this uh, safety hammer 60 percent and the automatic will have 80 to 90 percent therefore you n value measured from the automatic hammers will have a very low value compared to the donut system which have a very high values so we need to calibrate it and normalize it to 60 percent energy transfer that is as per the ACM standards and why these standards are necessary because non-standard SPT systems delivers highly variable energy values to drive the rod. Energy transfer affects the N values. And soil strength estimated from N value is based on experience that is an average N value. So we need to have a normalized N value so that everybody is talking on the same page. And to obtain the normalized N60 is to have a more reliable static soil analysis. Otherwise, there will be a different analysis from different people will have a different yield measured values not normalized to a 60 percent energy transfer and finally ASTM the 6066 the liquefaction potential is estimated from N60 this is characterized so in order to have all this you need to normalize the SPT to 60 percent energy transfer so this is how you do it. it is a field measured values correction for hammer efficiency there are other corrections like your correction for borehole diameter sampler and rod correction i think generally we use this so there's no need for borehole corrections with a sampler without liner also not required if the rod length is less than 10 meters you apply appropriate corrections if it is deeper boreholes more than 10 meters you don't need to have any applied corrections right now, overburden correction, this is also given in IS codes. We normally apply that overburden. And this is also from literatures of various researchers. It's the same thing what we use in the IS code, which is the standard penetration test standardized at one kg per centimeter square effective overburden pressure that will have no corrections. If you're going deeper, which has a more overburden pressure, then your corrections become smaller. You are doing the test at the shallow depths, your correction becomes larger, right? Now, Greece, there's some experience. They have done 900 measurements, but they finally evaluated that for a, a manual hammer, the energy transfer could be 46%. For an auto hammer, it could be around 77%. This is in Saudi experience. So people have measured an average energy of around 86%. Okay. So what if you have an N value of 15, you don't make corrections, then you assume there's a 60% energy transfer, your N value becomes 11 right on the contrary you have a 90 percent which is a measured uh, energy your n value can be 17 see that 12 to 17 is a huge difference and also the computation of bearing capacity with an n value of 10 with the assumption of 60 percent will give you 150 kilopascal with an actual measurement if you compute it there's a 66 percent increase in the bearing capacity and so with a n value of 15 there's a going to be a 30 percent increase in the bearing capacity now, incorrect SPT would lead to conclusion that soil improvement is required. No soil improvement is required based on the corrected SPT data based on the energy measurements. So that way you can save cost, time, everything. So this is the importance of measuring the energy. How it is done? So it's normally done by a instrumented rod. It has embedded strain sensors and a usable or a <coughs> axometer pair of axometers which can be bolted to the rod it will be connected to the other segments of the rod and then to the sampler these connections are brought to the spt analyzers as you're giving the blows this is measuring your force and velocity and thus it will calculate your energy transferred so i'm not going to talk in the theoretical background but i'm only talking about the usage of that so way back in 1995 this spt analyzer has been used and they have measured that there is a 39% transfer of energy and so with a 66% with a different driving system. Similarly, we started calibrating that our rigs 
to measure the transferred energy. So one of them is instrumented here, ready to be tested, and is connected to the SPT analyzer. So I draw your attention here. This is the blow count number. As you come to the end of this 30 centimeters, you have a blow of 39. That is the N value is 39. The yellow one is your EMX is the energy transfer. You take the weighted average of all of them will give you 89.6 kilojoules. Actually, the potential energy is about four joules. Amounts to the transfer of about seen in the international literatures, right? You have N value of 39. And you have this EMX of only 89.6, which gives you a transfer energy of 20%. You want to correct this to X to play a rate to 60% normalized energy. So N will be about 12. Over by if you don't apply your correction, then straight away apply the war button for this, then this becomes 60. So as against 20, you have a 60 N value, which actually over predicts your capacity. And so with the energy is much higher, say 90%, you're under predicting the capacity and that's where your normalization is necessary. And I repeat that every rig has to be calibrated. So what is that energy transfer from that rig? So that correction has to be applied as a field correction. And then you use that N value for further processing as per the IS codes. And this is the flow chart. You have a field corrections both by ASTM method, then get your N60 based on soil type. You apply over button pressure correction and the dilatancy corrections. Both of them are in the IS codes. The field corrections are in the ASTM codes. Our IS codes doesn't talk about it. We are trying to take it up through IGS to inform the BIS. This is very important and see if they can bring out the revision. Now the last part of this presentation, maybe another five minutes I'm going to finish, is very important. You have conducted the SPT test as the borehole is advanced in the investigations. Then finally, when you encounter rock, you're going to use the rock coring tools. So this is a core barrel, single two core barrels, where the drill fluids is coming in direct contact with the samples. So all these materials, if it's weathered, weak material get washed away. If you use a double tube core barrels, the water is going into the outer annular space. Okay, it's not coming in direct contact with the core samples. But if you use a triple tube core barrels, you will also have one more liner piece inside that will give you the best quality of this. You will see in the next few slides mm -hmm. before I conclude this, how important it is to collect the core samples from triple tube core barrel. This is a triple tube core barrel. This is a liner sampler insights and then you have the water coming from the outer tubes. And if you open this liner, you can get nice cores. I'm going to skip this. All of you are familiar. What is the recovery ratio and RQD? Okay, perhaps uh, based on the RQD, you can I have to identify the quality of the rock mass. If it is high, you have excellent. If you have very low RQD, is very poor. Now various bits has to be used is a core catcher, okay? And this is a reamer shell. On top of these reamer shells, you can have the bits. This is a tungsten carbide bit. And this is the surface set bit. This is an impregnated diamond bit. So this surface set diamond bit will have only one layer of studs, diamond studs. As you core it and this gets damaged, you have to throw the bit. And here in the surface impregnated bit, once the first layer is worn out, then there will be a second layer is coming out. So they will have a better uh, production here so you can drill deeper depths and also stronger uh, talks this is a shale samples okay uh, without triple tube we will not be able to get any of these core samples you no know, direct contact of uh, the drill fluid with the samples will wash away all these weak materials so why is this triple tube necessary the practical advantage of sampling in weathered rock using triple tube core barrels I think I'll finish these sessions in the few slides, about less than five minutes. Rational solutions to geotechnical engineering problems are possible only through proper sampling in exploration and testing. In Bangalore, generally we have three layers. One is the ore button, the other one is the sheet rock. And you have an in-between layer called weathered rock or refusal stratums where you conduct a penetration test, you have more than 50, but you cannot get the core samples. So quantification of these layers becomes very important. 
for the following reasons. It is highly difficult to quantify all the layers using the SPT, single tube, four barrels and colleagues. Thus, these investigations becomes unsuccessful. Okay. Now, why is this important? This is important for the rational design of foundations because people wanted very high bearing capacity. Unless you quantify that layers, you will not be able to evaluate very high bearing capacity. And also excavation through these materials is become going to be very challenged. The contract says they're going to be a two line items. No one is your proclaimed for overburden. You have some diamond cutting or other material for hard rock, but there's no contract for in between uh, transition layers. This is neither soil nor rock. So this leads to some lot of contractual obligations. <clears throat> Thus, it is imperative that you quantify the layers. Okay. Now, these calculations based only on yen will no doubt be safe, but uneconomical. If the samples could be obtained in the transition zone, this uncertainty in the design can be removed. And this is only possible with the use of triple tube four barrels as illustrated below. Even IS codes prescribes to use the triple tube four barrel, right? Now, there was a project we did, which has a overburden burden of nine meters and the refusal stratums where N is recorded at 50, single tube core barrels, there was no core recovery or RQD, okay? There's a drop in N which requires the water table. Sorry, there's some typo error here. And this is a weathered rock or a very dense silty sand. On the contrary, in the same locations, if you use a triple tube core barrel, when you have a refusal stratums, and you see you can have the core samples and measure the unconfined composition strength about three to five MPa. Right? Now, just to give you an illustration, so if you want to have a drill pier, total capacity is a point resistance and the skin friction. I'll estimate based on N value of 50, okay? so. For the large diameter board coils, you have nine times CU. Instead of that, you can take five times CU as suggested by Brahms, and you compute your point resistance, you get 0.5 MPa. If you're just assuming that N equal to 50. On the other side, if you have a core samples, which measures the three MPa of your unconfined composite strength, with a factor of safety of three, you can get one MPa as point resistance. So you have a 100% increase in your capacity, okay? <sighs> Now this was uh, for a project which has a diaphragm wall. Three sides, you can see here, this side has actually failed because the anchors that they put to hold the diaphragm walls gave away. And this was uh, the same site we did the correlations between the Cali single tube and the double tube. So nicely you can see the weather drop formation. If you put a single tube core barrel, you will not be able to get these core samples. Same thing in the second project, also you have a refusal uh, layer no core recovery is a single tube and in the triple tube core barrels you can get core samples which has about 10 mpa shear strength right and if you want to make an assessment of the bearing capacity use a tank equations so you can use any equations for that matter no problems as the thumb rule says one n equal to one ton per meter square so you get allowable of about say 50 ton per meter square so 49 491 kilonewton per meter square if you have a UCC of 10 MPa, the ultimate bearing capacity is equal to your UCC itself. With a factor of safety of three, you get around 300 tons per meter square. Even with a factor of safety of 10 is 1,000, which is almost double the value, which apparently you get it only with N equal to 50, because you cannot measure N value beyond that. The uh, weight will jump, and then it will also damage your shoes. The last case study, which I conclude, also have this. You can see your measurement of the unconfined composite strength in the order of about 15 MPa for that. So similarly, bearing capacity computations, pile capacity and other things can be done. More importantly, this is important, particularly in a region like Bangalore where deep excavations are being adopted. You need to have the justification, quantification of the transition layers for choosing an appropriate uh, excavation methods. Now, use of this triple tube core barrel provides the best estimate of shear strength since the rock cores can be recovered, otherwise not possible in the refusal stratum. Okay. It is very important to have the sample in the refusal or transition due to quantify the stratum as a dense soil or drop due to this and economical foundation foundations designs can be developed. And lastly, the proper quantification of stratum enables choosing appropriate excavation methods, particularly in the weather drop formations. 
So with this, I think I will conclude my presentations. We talked about the offshore uh, investigations, sampling methods, CPTs. We come to the on land. We talked about the SPT. How important is the energy corrections? And finally, the use of triple tube core barrel. How is also important in to quantify the transition layer between the over button and the sheet rods. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ramesh, uh, for the opportunities. Uh, I, if you have any questions, then I can. Answer. There are some so questions, I, Parsa. Yeah, can I sh stop the share? We can read the questions. I can answer it. Yeah. Uh, when the seabed is uneven. Uh, yeah. What type of pile is recommended? Pile? Yes. What is the type of piles you are recommending? Oh, see, seabed is uneven. Piles are going to 150 meters below the seabed. Seabed is uneven. It doesn't hamper anything for the pile foundations. Only for the shallow foundations, it may affect it. That is where even before choosing a location, you have to go with the geophysical methods to see that there is a uniform layer and you choose that layer for your emplacement of your structures. Particularly the jacket structures has a mud mat. The mud mat cannot be on an uneven or undulating because inclinations will induce a lot of additional forces. The designs will be much uneconomical. Okay. Now, the reason one question was there, but sir, the actually, yes, what type sir. of test you are going to conduct on the washed sand piles? Because <laughs> whenever we say washed sands to say that, Many, many, uh, our geotechnical engineers, they will identify how much percentage is silt is there, sand is there and all that. Oh, no. But from my side, it is wrong. Completely Absolutely, you are correct, sir. Wash samples is uh, useless because all the fines are washed away. And why you use wash samples? So only because you are not using appropriate drill fluid. Bentonite is not used because it's costlier than cement. So what happens? All the fines get washed away and this coarse materials is not able to displace and come out. So then while you take out your core barrel, this is all rotary method, we are not doing wireline method. You take out your core barrel, then you put your SPT, it may take about one, two hours time. Okay, if you do a, a drilling with a drill fluid, these particles will be in suspension because of the viscosity. But if you don't use a drill fluid, it automatically settles. So then what happens, the bottom half a meter or one meter, you will have these wash samples. You drive your SPT, it is not in merging ground. You collect your undisturbed samples, it is not a good samples. Yes. Okay. Next is, hello. Yeah, yeah go ahead, go ahead, sir. Uh, the, there is a, one more question is uh, how to find C and file for an samples which is uh, just uh, slips away from our UDS sampling. Without so we don't yeah, there using no without samples you cannot uh, find out you have to find out uh, based on your uh, SPTN value if you do yeah. CPT values if you do samples slips yeah. out you cannot you go to the yeah. next increment if it is within the same strata then you pick up that uh, samples and test it without testing probably you have to go with some empirical uh, correlations uh, because of this only the predictions has become. Uh, very popular so you may have to use some predictive empirical predictive models to fairly get an idea of what could be the material properties so actually somebody has asked with respect to the end bearing piles what will be the limitations almost all the textbooks i believe that they have been given for that uh, very clearly so i don't think it is uh, required to answer for that type of question so the last question i would like to go here is nothing but can the dense sand overlay the loose sand in the field and what is the effect of overburden pressure in this situation so that means to say they are taking the loosest sand in the upper layer then sand at the bottom so automatically the overburden pressure must be lower uh, probably i have not encountered the situations you have a loose sand uh, overlying a dense sand you could see a dense sand underlined by a weak layer that is soft place yeah I don't think I recall any locations having a loose sand. Probably the location, some locations have a weaker materials, uh, two layers. One has a high relative density, other one has a low relative density. Probably you just go by whatever the measurements you have, unit weights you have, then appropriately depth is there, then compute your ore burden pressure and apply that appropriate corrections for if you are using your SPT values. Did I answer the question? One more, yeah, one more question. 
how accurate is the spt value however the soil may get disturbed during the working principles how accurate is the spt value is the question yeah the entire second half of presentations i think i stretched SPT more value. on normalizing the energy and this is yes. because of uh, the obvious reasons and uh, you have to have appropriate uh, drilling techniques clean the boreholes ensure that your measurements are correct you go into the right depth when conducting the standard penetration test such that you are pushing the uh, sampler into the ground at the bottom of the borehole so not on the contaminated uh, soil that is set uh, sling from the past uh, methods so if you are there at the bottom of the boreholes and all these uh, photos i show showed on the sampler is all original samples if you get that original samples you get was and even that was samples it will slip if it a catcher at the bottom right so there, these are simple things uh, sir we need to uh, really Correct. keep in mind drilling fluid most of the contractor doesn't use drilling fluid because it's a cost it is more exactly. expensive than the cement they used to not to do the they try to use casing better it will not be used but usually many of the geotechnical investigation people do not use triple due to that essentially within the given rocks sedimented rocks yeah, i yeah. call it as a sedimented or disintegrated rocks so that is an one of the not in a good testing element there okay uh, uh triple tube nobody use a triple tube because uh, is one expensive not expensive. many people have and mostly you see the contractors when i was a site in year 25 years before so there was only hardly about five investigation agency today you can see about 100 right out of 100 yeah. i could see that 98 96 per, uh, per people 96 percent of the people are the agencies they use a calyx primitive rig and uh, you cannot use a triple tube core barrel in a calyx rig so no because it wobbles it doesn't rotate under an axis you need a hydraulic rig so how many people have a hydraulic rig you say why i need this then the commercial comes into picture so only some clients know who sees value in this uh, information they tend to do it and all the projects that uh, i have done for the last uh, say five six years i tend to do this with uh, triple tube four barrels and i have made the uh, bearing capacity calculations to have a SBC values almost double than what the other agencies are giving. So that will also economize foundations, plus during the deep excavations, you know, if you don't quantify, as I speak, I know I uh, there are three projects that are in arbitrations because the contract doesn't specify uh, the uh, just a quantification of the layer. There are only two line items. One is a poplin, the other one is uh, your hard rock, like your granite or knees, which can have a diamond cutting or something. But in between, the poplin cannot excavate, and if you take the samples, it's not hard rock as per the contract. So what the contractor will do, he will just run away. Yeah, truly, truly. The last question is, if uh, there is a condition, if excavation is going on, and if suddenly sand boiling happens, what is the role of the geotechnical engineering? Sand boiling happens is because uh, of uh, your loss of shear strength. <laughs> Loss of shear strength that has to be predicted ahead and you doing this then you have to just uh, put back the soil and then <laughs> later on <laughs> you do it <laughs> probably tomorrow i'm speaking the, on the ground improvement to this ici indian concrete institute i yeah. show some of the photographs deep excavations 20 30 meters they excavate for a tunnel oh, no, our method finally after excavating they want solutions how can you give a overnight solution when they're already almost done they need about 40 hours to concrete it and then the backfill it only Correct. then I could do that is to pay God that there will not be any monsoon. So, uh, <laughs> fortunately, they finished that uh, concreting. Right. Hmm. So, uh, these are the some of the questions what they have been asked. So that means to say again and again we say that geotechnical investigation is very important, such that all the foundations has to be placed properly and designed the proper to present the type of foundation also. Right. For all my geotechnical consultants. Please make sure of that. What is a, a geotechnical invest, proper geotechnical investigation has to be carried out. Otherwise, we don't predict properly the strength of the soils. Uh, I'll just uh, go over to Prasad sir for his. Sir, uh, thank you for your uh, valuable uh, presentation. 
so apart from uh, consultants i think it was a nice uh, uh, if, i mean a uh, knowledgeful session for young minds practicing engineers also so i also hope all the questions have been addressed by parthas sir sir so thank you for uh, thank you once again for your uh, uh, good webinar today sir thank you sir thank you thank you